very firm and, and hard and uncomfortable inside. Um, or it may just be an aching sensation uh, in one particular quadrant or one side of the breast that feels particularly tender and bruised inside. But there may not be anything much to see on the outside. Sometimes the breast will look a little bit pink in that area. Um, and, you know, sometimes when people are treating their blocked ducts, they're doing a lot of massage during nursing and pumping, and sometimes they actually make the area red from all the, all the rubbing and pressing they're doing. So when we say gentle massage, we do mean gentle massage. Okay, so let's get to our, uh, our presentation today, block ducts and mastitis. And really, it's a continuum. So these are not um, two very, very distinct and different um, diagnoses. These are uh, uh, related. Uh, you have a breast that might be over full, and um, that can lead to inflammation within the breast, and that blocks an area off. And usually, we're able to manage the block duct and clear the, the fullness and get the milk flowing through there again. Um, and so it does not uh, continue into mastitis. Um, rarely, mastitis does occur without a block duct first, but uh, fairly commonly, a mom will have a block duct and then it progresses into mastitis. Uh, mastitis that occurs without a block duct first is probably more likely to be uh, an infectious mastitis as opposed to a mechanical blockage, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, and then also, somewhere in this continuum, is something called a clogged nipple pore, and that's what we were just ta talking about. Um, other words for them are blebs or milk blisters. So again, I, I just want people to realize that um, overfulness of a breast and the inability to fully uh, drain or empty a breast thoroughly uh, is, is ultimately what could lead to a blocked duct and, and uh, result in mastitis as well. But mastitis could be both an infectious process or just an inflammatory process. And we'll talk more about that. So here's some fun facts. Um, you know, and I'm being a little sarcastic here because there's really nothing much fun about uh, talking about these, these painful things. Um, but blocked ducts really are common. Uh, most women will experience a blocked duct. Um, and some people will have blocked ducts uh, over and over again, sometimes in uh, the exact same area of their breast. And that could be due to um, a particular reason, like you sleep on that side all the time, or uh, you wear your messenger bag across your shoulder, and so the strap is always pressing against your left breast on the top. Um, or it could be something uh, mechanical, anatomical inside the breast. So there could be an area of the breast that just doesn't drain so well. So um, that, that breast is more likely to have a blockage. Or you could have uh, frequent block ducts that just move around, either breast, any portion of the breast. Um, you know, they pop up in all different places, but they just, you know, uh, once or twice a month, you've got a block duct. So these are all different options. Um, and you don't get to pick from them. <laughs> you're, just, you're just stuck with them. But you can maybe work on uh, avoiding and treating them better. Uh, and then mastitis, it depends on what sources uh, you use and what people call mastitis and so on. But uh, probably about 25% of, of breastfeeding women uh, may have a mild, a mild mastitis, um, if not more severe mastitis. Um, in the picture here, it's a picture of a block duct. And you can see that a particular lobe of milk-making tissue um, gets inflamed. And then the milk kind of backs up a little bit into it. Um, and um, it's not quite that clear cut. I put that picture here to represent the block duct. And that's, you know, in the textbooks, this is what they call a block duct. Um, now, mastitis uh, is even more fun. Mastitis um, can be a bacterial infection. So there truly can be germs involved, um, like uh, strep or staph. Staph aureus is the most common one. Now MRSA is around in the community so much, um, and uh, MRSA is, is we're, we're finding more and more um, uh, MRSA with mastitis. Um, but mastitis does not necessarily mean there's an infection. People always think about it as an infection. It definitely means that there's an inflammation. But different things can cause inflammation. It also gets really confusing, because even if you do have non-infectious, non-bacterial mastitis, sometimes we still will treat with antibiotics. And the antibiotics actually still do help, even though it may not be a bacterial mastitis. And the reason for that is that um, antibiotics themselves actually have uh, an anti-inflammatory aspect to them. And um, it's very common uh, to have a, a super infection. If something's going on uh, inside the skin tissue, some, maybe the antibiotic actually prevents another, another infection really taking root. Um, 
a little Latin lesson for you. Um, anytime you see itis after a word, it means inflammation of. So mastis is actually the Latin word for the breasts. And so mastitis simply means inflammation of the breast. And so we're going to play a little game here. And um, think of all the different itis words you know. Like here's an easy one, appendicitis. That's inflammation of the appendix. And then there's gingivitis. And people don't, you may not know, but gingiva is the Latin word for your gums. And then you've got phlebitis. And that's the Latin, that means uh, inflammation of the veins. And then endocarditis, that's inflammation of the um, the, uh, the the endo the the outside of the heart tissue and meningitis inflammation of the meninges of the brain and so on so anytime you see the word itis it just means inflammation there's your Latin lesson for the day uh, skin integrity so if you have a crack or a, an open area of the breast that is just um, an entree for bacteria to come in and so um, it does not it's not a bad idea. If uh, your seven-month-old cuts a front tooth, and even despite your best efforts, and every single week we have questions about how do I keep my baby from biting during breastfeeding, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later too. Um, but you know, uh, as unpleasant and painful as biting is, if your baby nips you and there's an open area uh, in your nipple, then keep your nipple clean, and it's not a bad idea to put on bacitracin or polysporin. Um, a couple of times a day to prevent an infection from setting in because that, that is one way that moms can get mastitis. Um, let's see. Uh, in terms of, um, I did mention the bacitracin and the polysporin. Um, and uh, I always remember what I learned uh, many, many years ago. No, no, no neosporin. So uh, neosporin is like polysporin, but it contains neomycin and about 50% of uh, of people are sensitive to neomycin, and so here you are putting on a cream on your nipple that's supposed to make your nipple uh, or your crack heal better or prevent infection, and instead you're causing even more irritation to the nipple. So if you do need to put um, an over-the-counter anti, uh, antibiotic cream, uh, first aid cream on your nipple, use bacitracin or polysporin, and remember, no, no neo neomycin or no, no neosporin. Okay. Um, then there are some prescription creams that you would be getting from your doctor if you had a, a crack. Basically, any crack uh, or blister or wound on the nipple that's not getting better in three days, you should be talking to your doctor about that because uh, sometimes uh, either or your lactation consultant because sometimes your your um, the the latch uh, itself is perpetuating the wound, but sometimes it means that there's another infection that's preventing it from healing. So an over-the-counter antibiotic like um, cream, like Bactroban or Fusidin uh, can be helpful. Apno, many people are familiar with Apno cream, which actually just stands for all-purpose nipple ointment. But that's a, a Bactroban, that's a, a potent antibiotic, two separate kinds of antifungals, and a mild uh, steroidal cream. And uh, that's mixed up by the friendly pharmacist. And it's very helpful and it's very effective uh, when used for the right reasons. Unfortunately, because it's a compound, for some people, it's very, very expensive. Um, if your insurance does not cover compounds, it's very discouraging to go and pick up your medication and find that they want $80 for this little tube of uh, appointment. So um, you know, just going with a Bactroban or a Fusidin uh, is, is not a bad idea either. OK. Um, and, um, and uh, in general, mastitis is most common during uh, the first one to two months after having your baby, but it can happen anytime. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you a personal note myself, I had severe mastitis, I think, when my baby was nine or, or ten uh, months old. I was really sick. Um, and uh, yeah, can really, anytime, any, any, at any point in a lactating woman, you can have mastitis. Those are your fun facts. Okay, let's review some anatomy. Um, so talking about block ducts is primarily what we're going to talk about. And um, you can see that there are these little um, lobes uh, of uh, alveoli that make milk. And then um, so there's these little pockets of, of tissue that make the milk, and then it transports the milk down the ducts. And um, uh, this year, we don't have any milk sinuses. We used to, but we don't anymore. Uh, so it goes down the ducts and out the nipples. Um, and there is your basic breast anatomy. So it looks all nice and tidy, and you can see how a blockage can happen deep in the in the breast tissue, but it's not really that neat and tidy. In fact, um, your breast is um, more of a tangle inside. So I put the other picture there as a reference on the right, but in real life, this is actually what breasts look inside. And if you, um, I, most of you are probably not old enough to have your mammograms yet, but you actually get to see your milk ducts when you have your mammogram. It's pretty cool, and you see this tissue. 
Um, and it really does look like a tangle of roots. Uh, or, uh, as I was saying, um, it looks like a bowl of spaghetti in there. So it's not as neat and orderly and tidy as, uh, as the first picture leads you to believe. So there's not a direct root from the nipple pore where you can trace back and say, okay, this pore drains this quadrant or this area of the breast. It's, it's not linear that way. And your nipple really is very much like a shower head, except it doesn't have quite so many pores or holes to let the milk out. Um, on average, uh, we think maybe it's got somewhere between uh, 5 to 15 uh, openings where the milk comes out. So certainly, you know, numerous ducts may merge further up in the breast and drain out of the same pore. Okay, so you can imagine what happens when, uh, when one of those uh, pores gets backed up, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, when we talk about bleb. So just to kind of wrap up, as I said, Cindy thinks I, I'm always beating a dead horse and I'm very uh, redundant, but um, I, if I put it right on the slide. Let's just beat that dead horse. Um, your breast anatomy is not as neat and orderly as the top picture would lead you to believe, and you can't look at the picture down below and say, okay, a blocked up. If it's, you know, it just, it's, it's, it's like a, a nice lobe and it just drains out and, and that's what it looks like. No, it's more like a bowl of spaghetti um, and they have to empty out of these pores. So let's talk about a clogged nipple pore. So imagine the shower head, and it's got those 5 to 15 holes in it. It doesn't matter how many holes. However many holes your nipple has, it's the right amount of holes for you. You don't have to count them, and you couldn't count them anyway if you tried. But um, imagine that each one of those holes, instead of leading back to the water pipe, like, like in the picture here, each one drained a very particular individual water pipe. And if you blocked it off, you're going to build up pressure behind it. So if, if, if something can't come out through the hole, then it's, it's just sitting behind it, building up pressure. Now, what does Elmer's glue have to do with all this? So the bottom picture, you see a clogged nipple pore or a bleb. It looks like a little white dot or a little yellowish white pimple on the, on the nipple. And you almost only see it right after the nipple comes out of the baby's mouth or the moment you stop pumping and look at your nipple. Because after a little while, because the pressure pulls the, the dry, thickened milk out, but the, but the pore is sealed over, and so it can't escape. And so you're seeing uh, the milk that's been kind of pulled by vacuum, but unable to escape. And often there is a blocked duct area uh, somewhere deep in the breast that's feeling firm and, and tender and uncomfortable. And as we mentioned earlier, often that little bleb is very, very uncomfortable uh, and irritated to touch. Now, what does that have to do with the Elmer's glue? So most of you Americans are familiar with Elmer's glue and the orange cone on the top. And you all know that uh, what usually happens is um, the glue dries over the orange cone and seals it off. And even if you unscrew the top a little bit so that it's the, the glue should flow when you squeeze it, it's not going to flow out if the top is sealed over with dried glue. And everybody knows in, at home, what do you do? You unhook a paper clip. Um, and you stick a paper clip in there, and that clears the blockage, and then you can squeeze the bottle, and the glue, the glue will come through. Well, there you go. That is uh, essentially a clogged nipple pore or a bleb. Um, now, we're not going to stick a paper clip in there. That would not be a good idea. Um, so what we try to do is uh, essentially melt or move away the glue in a safe and hygienic fashion. So uh, one way to do that is to take some uh, warm olive oil on a cotton ball, and tuck that against your nipple inside your bra and let that sit for a few hours uh, in between nursing and pumping and, and, and so on. Uh, and that may help soften the tissue. Um, and when you do nurse or pump, it may help uh, loosen the, the, the glue, essentially, uh, and move it away. Now, uh, sometimes it actually does need to be moved mechanically with a sterile needle. And it's uncomfortable, but you're not sticking the needle into the nipple. Um, it, it's still a little bit uncomfortable, and these little suckers come back. So sometimes it takes two or three attempts to clear them uh, before they finally pack up their bags and go home for good. But we're going to talk more about um, the block the block duct because a lot of the treatment is the same in terms of clearing a block duct, preventing mastitis, um, and um, managing these clogged nipple pores. They're all related. They're all on the same spectrum. Okay, so um, anything that causes pressure or bruising or interrupts the milk flow within the breast tissue can lead to a blocked up. Um, poorly fitting bras, if the bra is too tight, whether it's an underwire bra or non-underwire bra, if it's really tight and it's pressing against breast tissue instead of your rib cage, 
um, it can create blockage. Um, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't tell people to avoid underwire. If they're large breasted and they need an underwire or prefer an underwire, then really my caveat is that's fine. It must be properly fitted to you. And it can be hard, as some of larger breasted women know, it can be really hard to find uh, a wide variety of sizes of underwire bras that really, you know, so you can really get fitted and, and um, find one that fits well. Um, another cause is, is uh, straps uh, of baby carriers. So certain types of baby carriers uh, or the way you're wearing the baby carrier can press against the breast tissue. And that's something to pay attention to if you're having uh, a chronic issue with block ducts in a certain area, you need to pay attention as you go about your day and night and see what are you doing um, that might be putting pressure on that particular area of the breast. Um, a messenger bag or a laptop bag or your pumping bag uh, slung across your body or pressing in on your breast tissue certainly could do it. Okay. Um, other very common reasons why people get block ducts, um, and you know these are kind of these are kind of good things that happen, but they're not. Um, they're not uh, happy situations when it's creating pain in your breasts. So um, sometimes these things are all related. Sometimes the baby gets older and starts sleeping longer at night. So you begin to go longer in between uh, nursing or pumping. Um, and meanwhile, you're sleeping soundly, thankfully, finally, all you zombie moms are sound asleep on your side or on your tummy while your breasts are slowly filling more and more with milk and you're creating pressure in the breast tissue, leaning into the breast tissue. So if you think that's your problem, if you sleep on your side and you're starting to struggle with blocked ducts and you're, you know, now your baby is going five or six or seven hours at night, um, think back to when you were pregnant and you strategically used pillows to support your body. So think about that. Is there a way you can tuck pillows next to your rib cage or under your armpit or something so that you can sleep super comfortably uh, but not be leaning on your breasts while you're doing it. Uh, and then, of course, just skipping nursing, nursing sessions or pumping sessions um, can create overfulness or engorgement, and that can lead to block ducts. Okay. Um, other causes of block ducts. Anything that uh, initiates or creates the milk to let down uh, and then does not adequately remove the milk. So um, if the flanges, if you're pumping and the flanges aren't the right size, you may be able to stimulate or trigger uh, the milk uh, ejection reflex or your milk wet down. But if the flanges aren't the right size, then they may not effectively drain the breast very well. Also, sometimes when people are pumping, they jam the flanges deeply into the breast tissue. Um, and that can create some trauma or bruising inside the breast. And again, that kind of bruising in the breast can lead to a blocked duct. Um, and besides, if you're pressing your flanges really deeply into your breast tissue because that's the only way you can get the milk to come out, you probably do need larger flanges anyway. Um, breast an anatomy, um, just differences in the anatomy of your tissue can do it. So some women, for example, have a lot of breast tissue that extends all the way up into their armpits. Um, and uh, like day five after your baby's born, it might feel like you've got two softballs under your armpits. So some people actually have areas of their breasts that just don't drain well. Um, and so it's good to know that so that you can massage and, and uh, stroke and compress while you're nursing or pumping. Uh, and if you did have some sort of a, a breast biopsy or breast uh, augmentation or, um, or breast reduction surgery, any, anything that uh, interrupts the milk ducts, sometimes, again, same thing. You can, you, your body can make the milk, but you may have certain areas of the breast that don't drain the milk out as easily, and that can cause a blocked duct. So if you have a block duct, what do you do about it? So we're going to talk about traditional and then less, less uh, common treatments that are all effective. Um, basically, I want you to remember the mantra, heat, rest, empty the breast, add ibuprofen. Heat, rest, empty the breast, add ibuprofen. That's what we're going to think about. So um, heat, um, I like moist heat, but I couldn't find a good picture of moist heat. Uh, so a heating pad, a hot water bottle. Also, what works really nicely is um, take a, a wet washcloth and um, put it in a Ziploc bag and then put it in the microwave for 30 seconds and then test it. My goodness, test it on your, on your inner arm before you put it on your breast. Um, but a wet washcloth in a, in a Ziploc bag works really nicely for moist heat and it doesn't, doesn't get cold as, as fast and it doesn't drip all over you. Um, so here we are talking about heat. So why am I talking about cold too? So you can use heat before 
pumping or nursing, and cold after as a way to reduce inflammation. And my favorite cold pack are little bags of frozen uh, vegetables that you just refreeze and reuse, refreeze and reuse. So heat before and cold after. Heat, rest, empty the breast, add ibuprofen. Heat, rest, empty the breast. So rest, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about rest because, come on, you've got babies. Um, but what I do want to emphasize is pay attention to a block duct, lay low, and take care of it. Don't ignore it. Um, so you may not be resting a whole lot, but um, you're, you know, I would really suggest you, you try to lay low, try to be home, uh, nurse or pump frequently, and um, avoid doing stuff that's not essential. If you, if you, can, you, know, if you were going to meet your friend at the mall uh, and walk around, instead maybe have her come over you know, and bring lunch um, or plan it for the following week instead. Uh, stay lay low and um, empty the breast, whatever way is most, is most effective and most comfortable for you. So um, if, the, uh, if, if, it, if the breast becomes more and more painful, uh, sometimes it's actually more uncomfortable for the, for the baby to nurse, for you to have the baby nurse. So you may nurse the baby on the uh, non-sore side and decide to pump the sore side temporarily. It's up to you, but whatever way is going to be most comfortable and most effective, you have to keep the milk flowing uh, through the, the sore side. Heat, rest, empty the breast, add ibuprofen. At ibuprofen, also known as Advil or Motrin in the United States, is an anti-inflammatory. Uh, it's called an NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Um, and um, it is a, approved for use for breastfeeding women by uh, all of the approving bodies like the AAP and ACOG and, and um, uh, Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, etc. Um, and HALE and so on. Uh, but um, of course, check with your doctor because uh, everybody has individual uh, issues and it's possible that ibuprofen is not the best drug for you, in which case you could take Tylenol, which is good for fever and good for comfort, but does not have an anti-inflammatory uh, aspect. So 600 milligrams every six hours with food for two days. So you're not taking it in response to pain. You're taking it as an anti-inflammatory as part of your treatment plan to clear this blockage. Okay. Oh, and the clock is a nice reminder. 12-6, uh, 12, six, 12 six, for example. Um, 12 midnight, 6 a.m., 12 noon, 6 p.m. Uh, you know, whatever schedule you're on, you know, uh, could be 2-8, uh, 2-8, you know, two, eight, two, eight, but really take it around the clock. Um, another way to think about it is, is breakfast, lunch, dinner, bedtime with food. Okay. Other uh, less traditional treatments. This one is very effective. Dangle, I call it dangle, dangle feeding or dangle pumping. Um, hard to get a good picture of this, but essentially uh, imagine yourself um, on your hands and knees with no bra on. So your breasts are just dangling in free fall. And under you have your baby or your pump so that you are allowing your breasts just to hang as you dangle over your baby and let your baby nurse. Um, and that, that's an, that can help. Um, what's, what's very helpful is uh, to get into the shower and do your, your hot shower, your massage, uh, your comb through, and we'll talk about that, and then try your dangle feeding. I didn't really put these in order, but I would have put, I would have put that first. Um, a massager or a vibrator or what people often have at home, an electric toothbrush. Um, so if you have a, a firm area on your breast and you're having a hard time clearing it, just using, uh, using the, the, uh, the vibration for five or 10 minutes uh, several times a day can help loosen things up a little bit. Um, let's see, uh, doing massage, gentle massage during feeding or pumping. And um, these are just um, uh, breast self-exam diagrams that I put up there to, to you know, give the general idea. Um, I think I kind of like be the best because you're stroking from the base of the breast down toward the nipple. Uh, but, you know, you, you do whatever seems right to you as you massage your breast. But like we were talking about at the very beginning, um, when we say gentle massage, that is kind of what I mean. Um, don't be too aggressive because your breast is already uh, sore and tender and inflamed inside. So you, you don't want to be so aggressive that you're creating more bruising um, or irritation to the skin. Um, and then this is kind of odd, but also quite effective. Get in the shower. Uh, soap up uh, your hands nice and sudsy with soap or shampoo and get your breasts very, or your affected breasts very, very soapy and then use a wide tooth comb to gently start combing down like in picture B from the very base of the breast combing down toward the nipple. You don't need to comb your nipple. Um, but basically, uh, it's, 
I don't, it's just a very effective way um, to kind of get uh, an inch or two within the breast tissue and see if you can move things along. Um, it shouldn't be painful, uh, but uh, that's something that you can try. Um, and then lecithin uh, is a, a common food uh, additive or supplement. You can find this in your, your area whole, uh, whole Foods or Health Food Store. Uh, it comes in capsules or granules. And um, if you're buying it loose in granules, you can use one teaspoon three or four times a day, sprinkle it into yogurt or something that you'll eat. It doesn't taste bad. Um, or it comes in capsules and uh, uh, 1,200 milligrams uh, three or four times a day. Uh, and people that have chronic block ducts or chronic uh, blebs or milk blisters sometimes uh, do find that lecithin is, is helpful. Okay. Now, what if your block duct doesn't really seem to be getting any better, and then, in fact, uh, you feel like you're also coming down with the flu at the same time, like the perfect storm? Um, there's a, a quote that, uh, that says, um, you know, uh, fever or, or flu symptoms in a lactating women, you should assume mastitis until otherwise proven that it's not. So essentially, even if your breast doesn't hurt, and you come down with fever, you feel like you're going to be knocked over by, you know, you feel like you've been run over by a train, you're nauseous. Uh, all of a sudden, you go from feeling pretty fine to feeling like you're getting sick to feeling like you just, you just want to die. Uh, even if your breast doesn't hurt, I bet in six hours it will. Um, because that's often how mastitis presents itself. As I said, sometimes it presents first with a blocked duct and progresses to mastitis. And sometimes, you know, you're fine in the morning and by the evening, you know, you, you, you feel like you're, you've just about had it. So um, uh, fever, typically in the evening, uh, chills are very common, nausea and vomiting sometimes, um, and often uh, the breast it becomes excruciatingly painful. So in that case, you know, think a block duct plus the flu plus worse. That's mastitis. Mastitis can be mild and be kind of like a block duct that's, you know, just not getting better and you don't feel so great. But a lot of the time, mastitis can make you feel like you're at death's door very quickly. Um, the, the good thing is that it also gets better pretty quickly with antibiotics if that is the right treatment. Um, so with mastitis, often there is redness and inflammation to see on the breast. There's fever, nausea, chills, and you really do feel unwell. Um, perhaps like so unwell that you wonder, you know, you're probably not going to be able to take care of your baby. Um, you do need to call your doctor. Who's that doctor? I'm not even keeping up on the chat. In fact, I'm, I'm trying to ignore the chat these days because I find it so distracting. I put that up there as a little treat for you. Um, you need to call your doctor. Uh, they may or may not want to see you. They may just call in a prescription and say, if you're not better in four, you know, 24 hours, call me. Um, you, you actually do need to be seen um, if you can't stay hydrated. So uh, you need to be able to keep down liquids, and you need to be able to keep down your antibiotics. You know, and 80% and of the time, that's not a problem. People start the antibiotic. By the time they've had three antibiotic pills, you know, uh, 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 12, 24 hours later, they feel, you know, 50% better already. Um, but uh, if you are vomiting, if you can't keep down liquids, if, you, you know, if you're really feeling unwell, you need to be seen, and sometimes people even need um, uh, hydration in the emergency room, some fluid. OK. Um, I don't want to talk about abscesses, but I, I have to um, just mention it's very rare. But if you uh, have mastitis and um, it's not treated correctly, or it's not treated with the right antibiotic, um, or you're just an unfortunate person that has breast anatomy that created the situation, or luck of the draw, um, some, rarely, sometimes, mastitis can end up in an abscess. Um, and basically, the mastitis symptoms get better. Uh, but there's still a hard lump in the breast. Um, it may be tender, it may not. Uh, and uh, a lot of times um, people will say, oh, well, it's, it's a galactoseal. That just means a, a collection of milk um, that's sealed off in the breast. And it certainly could well be. Uh, and it could be uh, an abscess. Um, and it could be something else. So you know, I don't think that it's a great idea um, to ignore lumps in your breasts at any time, whether you're breastfeeding or not. Um, and so if there's a, a lump in your breast and it's not going away, uh, you need to speak to your doctor uh, and be seen. And typically the best way they will evaluate a big lump in the breast is using an ultrasound. And if it does look liquid in there, um, then they will do, I know it sounds scary, but it's not so bad. They'll do a fine uh, needle biopsy 
uh, or just draw out some of the liquid and then they'll look at it and say, yep, that's just milk, that's a galactoseal and we'll drain it, or they'll say, um, yep, that's an abscess from mastitis uh, and we need to drain it and give you better antibiotics. Um, and, and there you go. So that's what you need to do. So let's uh, wrap this up and review. Um, mastitis, block ducts, and blebs, they're bummers, um, but this too shall pass. Uh, not every breastfeeding mom is going to need to deal with this stuff, but a, a hell of a lot of you will. Um, and a block duct, um, even though you may, you may treat the block duct, um, it still uh, may take a, a day or two before your breast feels better. So it may feel bruised inside. Um, even even though the blockage is resolving. And uh, how do you know the blockage is resolving? Instead of feeling uh, firm, it begins to drain a little bit. Um, and you may notice, too, if you have one of those blebs and you clear the bleb or the milk blister and the milk begins to flow from that area now, uh, sometimes people will even notice there's a little bit of, especially if you're pumping, that's the only time you would see it, um, a little bit of, of mucus or stringy milk, um, people will say. There's, you know, there's like, my milk's stringy. Um, that's just because it's been sitting in the breast and, um, and liquid water has been absorbed from it. So it, it's, um, it's a little bit of irritation and, and so on. Uh, and that too will pass. Um, and um, during all of this, uh, the baby can continue to breastfeed and um, the antibiotics don't interfere with the baby's ability to get your milk. Um, and any infection in the breast is not dangerous for the baby. Um, and um, I just, you know, I hope this is helpful information and um, that you'll use it to help a friend because you hopefully won't need it yourself. But the reality is lots of are pretty common. Okay, so Cindy, thank you for your help. Will you put up the other deck and we'll answer questions? So I have, I, I see I have a question from a mom who had mastitis and now she's got questions about her milk supply. So let's get to that one. Okay. My supply was decreasing before I got mastitis, and now it continues to be low. My daughter's three months old. Here's my question, or two, or three. Uh, when is the best time to give a bottle of breast milk or formula to supplement for low supply? Is it best to give a bigger bottle in between nursing sessions or to give smaller bottles right after a feeding, which would have the least impact on her wanting to nurse later? And when... When is the best time to pump to rebuild your supply? Immediately after a feeding or an hour later? I worry that I won't have enough left if I, if I wait too long. Okay, good question, Paul. Um, yeah, in general, I, I, I almost always recommend pumping, for people that are with their babies rather than being at work, um, pumping directly after breastfeeding because of the reason that you described. Because usually what ends up happening is uh, if you try to time it for midway between two feedings, then the baby nurses, and then you wait an hour, and then you pump, um, and then the baby wants to eat again, and then you worry. So instead, I would breastfeed, and then I would pump uh, for five or ten minutes um, after breastfeeding without expecting that you're going to get a lot of milk. You may just get half an ounce from one side and three quarters of an ounce from the other, if that. But then you can unhook the tubing and stand the bottles and the flanges upright in the refrigerator in two coffee mugs, just like you see in the picture. Um, and then next time she wants to eat again, an hour or two later, take them out of the fridge um, after you breastfeed and hook the tubing up and pump a second time. And then later on in the day, a third time after breastfeeding uh, into the same collection set on top of the same milk. Just keep refrigerating and reusing uh, throughout the day. And uh, you know, quarter ounce by quarter ounce, you'll be adding milk to the bottles and you can use that for a supplement. But also um, by, by asking your body for more milk than it has easily and readily available, that's what sends the important message to your brain to increase supply and try to make more milk in the longer term. So to, I call that power pumping and people call power pumping different things. But um, by breastfeeding and then expressing for five or 10 minutes after breastfeeding, uh, is a very good way to ask your body to make more milk than it has readily available. And um, by doing that, uh, preferably, you know, uh, four or five times in 24 hours over the course of several days, people do begin to see a step up in their supply. You may not notice an increase in the amount of milk that you can express, but you may notice the baby uh, gulps, seems more satisfied after feeding, your breast may begin to feel a little fuller before feeding and softer after and so on. Um, and in terms of, of um, supplementing, I think um, I would probably, uh, if, you, if you are home with your baby, which I'm not sure about, your baby's three months old, so I'm not sure if you're back at work or not at this point, but um, 
I would nurse frequently uh, throughout the day in, you know, to, to try uh, to increase your production and um, to try to, to offer her as much milk as she's willing and able to take at the breast. Use a lot of breast compression, switch her side to side if she's getting, you know, fussy at the breast because the flow is a little slower. Um, then put her on the other side and then after a few minutes on that side, put her back on the first side again. So I call that nursing on three breasts. Um, and, um, and then probably as the day wears on, you may feel more and more nursed out. Um, and, uh, and usually uh, in the evening is when babies are kind of at their, at their highest need and they typically like to cluster feed. So that might be a good time uh, if you feel like your supply is, is truly low to use the, um, the milk that you have pumped. Uh, during the day after breastfeeding or to use expressed milk that's in the freezer or if you feel like you need to use something else then you would use uh, formula if that's what you've been doing. Um, but uh, I would I would probably um, supplement, I would probably try to feed very frequently um, throughout the day as long as you're with her and then use the supplements in the evening if needed. Um, okay, let's see. Here's a question from a mom who says, I seem to get a lot of clogged nipple pores after I pump but not after the baby breastfeeds. Why is this and what can I do? That's a great question. Um, and that may have to do with uh, the pump's ability to remove milk adequately from your, from your breast. So uh, make sure that your flange size is the right size. Do a lot of massage and compression while you're pumping. Um, and shift the angle of your nipple several times during your pumping session so that uh, you're hopefully um, removing milk from different areas of the breast. So, uh, typically, we line up. I don't know. If, I don't think I have it in this um, in this deck. But typically, uh, people begin to sit down and pump, and they they bullseye their nipple right in the center of the flange. Um, but halfway through your pumping session, I would actually shift the angle that your nipple is uh, directed within the flange and put and pump a little bit off center, so your nipple is kind of pointing off to one side, then onto the other side, and then have your nipple kind of angled so it's a little bit more uh, asymmetric. Uh, pointing up toward the ceiling and then down toward the floor. And you may find that that helps uh, empty the breast areas a little bit better. Um, and uh, wonder if you do need larger flanges. And um, also, if you're not, if you don't have the video on, um, on uh, using manual, manual massage um, during and, and after pumping, that one will be helpful for you. I can put that up at the end. Uh, it's a great uh, video from Stanford University that I refer to quite a bit. Okay, uh, this mom says, I have a burning sensation when nursing my four-week-old. I worry about it being a yeast infection, but it's not gotten worse, and baby has not developed thrush. Could it be something else? I also have a large protruding gland. I guess it's called this just under the nipple. Could it be that the latch is not good and this gland is simply being injured? Um, yes, is the burning sensation on both breasts or just uh, that one? I, I don't know. But, um, um, you know, it's anytime... Anytime uh, someone has nipple pain and there's not much to see on the nipple, like there's no obvious crack or blister, then um, you know, then the next obvious assumption that many people rush to make is that it's yeast. And we have people that are, you know, they've gone from nystatin to gentian violet to diflucan to boiling everything and vinegar and tree tea oil, um, and it's not yeast at all, you know. Um, so. Anything that creates friction against the face of the nipple is going to probably make the nipple irritated, and um, often that burning sensation is, is pretty typical for what you what you would have. So um, I would work on uh, making sure that her mouth is really wide open so that you can really get a nice pink latch in. Um, I would um, just make sure that she doesn't have uh, a, you know, tongue tie uh, or something that's preventing getting a nice deep latch. I'm looking for my. I think I have a nice. Deep latch picture somewhere here, like this one, that one is good. Okay, so uh, nice wide uh, open mouth and, and so on. Um, let's see, in terms of positioning, um, I'm looking to see, four weeks, yeah, four weeks old. Um, in terms of positioning, when you have a, a, a little one like that, uh, I'm looking for my, my cross cradle position here. Okay, in cross cradle, um, make sure two things that, that um, I'd like to emphasize, three things I'd like to emphasize. The baby's nose and belly button should be in a straight line. So make sure that your baby isn't laying on her back with her head turned towards you. So the baby should actually be laying on their side uh, facing you so that you're tummy to tummy together and that her nose and belly button are in a straight line. 
Um, babies have a natural inclination. They want their head and spine to be in alignment. So if they're, if they're, if they're laying um, on their back a little bit, even though you have their head turned to nurse, uh, it makes it a little harder for them to nurse. And gradually, they're going to try to shift the angle of their head so it's in alignment to their spine. And that means they slide down the nipple. So maybe initially, you, you latched them on, and it was a nice steep latch. But 10 minutes later, they've actually slid down uh, an eighth of an inch. And now it's not a deep latch anymore. And that's what's going to make you sore uh, and create friction on the nipple. Uh, that's one thing I wanted to, to remind you, um, nose and belly button in a straight line. Second thing is um, get the baby as close to you as you can. Now the underarm, if the baby is in the cross cradle position, we can all see the baby's top arm in both of these pictures. And where the heck is that un the underarm? Um, the other arm is just always in the way. And some people will tuck that baby's arm between mom and baby, between their bellies, to you know kind of get it out of the way and prevent the baby from flailing around and, and you know kind of um, get in the way of trying to latch. But that actually creates a little bolster or barrier that keeps the baby just a little bit further away. So think about that bottom arm coming around towards your rib cage under the breast like it's a big hug. And that actually brings the baby a little closer to you. And then the third thing I want to emphasize is the position of your hand when you're nursing in the cross cradle position, which, by the way, is my favorite position for moms with sore nipples because you have the most control. Um, and in this position here, uh, it's really hard to, to um, keep the baby close um, and prevent the baby from sliding down the nipple and, and coaching the baby's position. So um, a lot of people will, will latch in the cross cradle and then they switch arms and get the baby in, you know, move to the cradle position. And meanwhile, the baby may slide down that fraction of an inch and that's ultimately what makes you sore. The hand position here is really important. A wide open hand and it supports um, the base of the breast or um, or further back, make sure that your index finger and or your thumb are not encroaching on the areola because that actually restricts the baby's ability to take in a big mouthful of breast tissue. And um, if, you're, if your fingers, if your uh, index finger begins to get closer to the nipple, the baby is going to have a much shallower latch. So your hand should be wide open like a big C and it should be uh, supporting the base of the breast, but nowhere near the areola or the nipple. Okay, I think we'll take uh, maybe one more question. Um, well, actually, before people drop off, let me tell you, let me remind you um, to put this on your calendar for next week and tell your friends um, about the webinar or any uh, mom's lists or news groups that you're on. And next week, we're going to do um, part one of a three part series of milk supply. So we're going to talk about. Um, uh, reasons for milk supply issues, um, how to increase milk production, um, and uh, all of the different managements of milk supply issues, uh, as well as uh, women struggling with oversupply, and then the whole you know, four milk, hind milk imbalance issue, um, and misconception of, of the two different kinds of milk that don't exist. There is just one kind of milk, and people that are regular listeners know what that kind of milk is. It's called breast milk. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, here's a good one. I am getting ready to start solids with my baby. How often should I be breastfeeding between the solids? My baby is five months. Okay, so um, solid foods during uh, the first few months of introducing solid foods are really uh, for fun. It's a sensory experience. Um, gives the baby, uh, it socializes them to the feeding experience. This is this is how you sit up in a high chair, and you get used to having a bib on, and um, it's very exciting when you know the spoon comes your way or your finger dipped in something the baby's way. They get all excited, and um, and they learn how to how to manage flavors and textures in their mouth and so on. But it's really not about nutrition during these early weeks, and they're not going to take in any significant volume, calorie, or nutrition that's going to make a big dent in their uh, in their intake. So it really will not change. Uh, their breast milk intake in any significant way for for several months or many months, um, and um, and initially when you introduce uh, solid foods, uh, typically you probably will do it once or twice a day. And so I really would think about it initially as an activity and plan a time of day that you have time and you and the baby are in a good mood. Um, and so you know depending on what your life is like, if you're working, whatever. 
Um, but um, again, think about it like an activity as opposed to a meal, because it will take quite a while before it's truly a meal um, in terms of, of calorie and, and filling and things like that. Uh, the other thing I'll just remind people is that breast milk is a, a full and complete uh, food, and it has 100% of everything the baby essentially needs, the fats and uh, the calories and the carbohydrates and the proteins, it's got all the right balance. Whereas something like um, you know common baby foods like applesauce or carrots um, really um, are nutritionally sparse and they actually don't have a lot of calories either. So four ounces of baby food carrots has about 40 calories, a little vitamin A, a little vitamin C, and a whole lot of water, uh, and not much else. And breast milk, four ounces of breast milk, uh, has about uh, 90 calories, and it's got the protein, the carbohydrates, all the vitamins and and, and uh, minerals and fats and everything in the right uh, in, in in the right proportions. And so, why would we want to try to pack in you know a whole jar of baby food carrots if it's going to end up taking the place of a more nutritious uh, meal of breast milk? So, um, so again, think about dabbling in solid foods, especially during the first month. If the baby's into it and chomping at the bit and leaning forward and squealing because you're not going fast enough, then you go with the baby's interest and you just keep, you know, you can keep spooning it in as long as the baby is still interested. Um, it's the it's the trying to push it or coax it or feed the you know these um the applesauce and the carrots and, and the green beans three times a day because people think it's nutritious uh, or think that the baby needs it. Uh, it's certainly not going to help the baby sleep better at night. And, in, and to that point, um, I would always introduce new foods early in the day. And um, I wouldn't feed the baby late in the evening or just before bedtime because um, uh, any more than you would think it would be a good idea to eat a big meal and then go to bed because especially when the baby's uh, GI tract is just learning how to digest food, uh, you don't want to put them to sleep with a lot of food in their belly and have them working on digesting it all night long. Um, if they are extra gassy or uh, now they're working on pushing something that's a little bit more than just um, milky poop through their GI tract, um, you know, you want them more uh, upright, moving around during the day, digesting, uh, as opposed to laying in their bed at night trying to digest rice cereal. So, okay, I think it's time for us to wrap up. I want to thank everybody for coming today. and. Um, uh, these uh, chats are recorded, so if you have a friend that tells you she's uh, she's been struggling with lost ups, you know you can share the link with her, and she can go on and, and listen to that. We have a uh, a nice uh, skin webinar coming up with um, the the pediatrician from MD Mom. Her name is Dr. JJ, uh, and that webinar Cindy's going to put the link up and tell us the date. I think it's the end of the month, and uh, on a Friday evening, the last Friday in February, if I recall. And uh, she's going to talk about cradle cap and infant acne and dry skin and eczema. And um, uh, I, actually, I'm going to ask her to talk about the yeast rashes that babies get in the summer under their skin folds and their neck. If you've got a, if you've got a roly poly baby, they often will get um, uh, moist skin uh, in their thighs, the diaper area, and so on. So that'll be a good webinar uh, for you. And um, I don't know, anything else, Cindy, we should talk about? Tell your pregnant friends, my friend Chris here, certified nurse midwife, does the um, pregnancy chat every Wednesday at 12. It's very much like this, uh, only it's focused on uh, pregnancy and, um, and birth. And uh, yeah, there we have it. So thanks. Come back next week. Put it on your calendar. It's the same link all the time. And uh, have a great week. Happy nurturing to you all. Bye-bye.